CPCC, Center for PCMH Advancement, Foundation for Medical Care, and Dr. Thomas Graff, Chairman of Community Practice and Associate Chief Medical Officer of Population Health at Geisinger Health System. Last year, several co-chairs within the center were involved with a task force that examined the role of care coordination as it relates to the patient-centered medical home. Through the help of Health2 Resources, this work resulted in an exciting report sponsored by Fitel and Merck called Core Values, Community Connections, Care Coordination in the Medical Home, which became the basis for this webinar series. Dr. Brock is the Chief Medical Officer for the Colorado Foundation for Medical Care and the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for Colorado. She spent 25 years in clinical practice in urgent care and occupational medicine. Dr. Brock received her MD from the University of Kansas and her MSPH and preventive medicine training from the University of Colorado. She is currently serving as the Chief Medical Director of the National Coordinating Center for Integrating Care for Populations and Communities AIM. Dr. Graff is, an, is Associate Chief Medical Officer for Population Health and Chairman of the Community Practice Service Line for Geisinger Health System. Dr. Graff is responsible for value reengineering of the care continuum and other population health initiatives for Geisinger, including the ACO portfolio and the physician group practice transitions demonstration with CMS. In addition to direct leadership and management of the community practice network, he has implemented nearly 40 NCQA Level 3 recognition medical home sites in the Geisinger Proven Health Navigator model. There's one more webinar left in this series. Don't forget to register today for it. We'll be discussing the patient's role in care coordination. And a couple of housekeeping items to cover before we get started. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. And there will be time at the end of the event for Q&A in which you may send questions using the question area at the bottom of the GoToWebinar controls. And we will be polling participants with a few short questions during and after the event. Please take some time to participate in this interactive portion of the webinar. A couple of other things I want to mention is that the October an annual summit will be held October 25th in Chicago this year, and the recording for this webinar will be available within one day on the PCPCC website. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jane Brock. Thank you. Um, it, it's a pleasure uh, being on this um, webinar series. I uh, am very impressed with the attendance that this event is, is getting, so I hope I can um, convey some helpful information for you all. Um, I, as, as um, has already been mentioned, um, am the medical director of a national initiative called Integrating Care for Populations and Communities that is a CMS-funded initiative through the Quality Improvement Organization contract. Um, so we are working very hard to um, try to integrate care um, on local community levels. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about why we are doing this, why we believe it, that this is the way to work, and then just sort of some nuts and bolts of uh, promising um, uh, things we did, you know, from great and small, uh, that we think um, are the kinds of things that, that we could really use the assistance from uh, primary care practices and specifically from medical home practices. Uh, so, oh, sorry. So this is usually, I used to always use this, uh, I put it as objective. Um, I used to always use this slide as my conclusion. Um, but really, just to jump to the punchline, um, you know, I can't say it any better than Jerry Garcia said it. When it comes to community-based action, it's really an, an issue of, it's clear that somebody has to do something, and it's incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. So, you know, we've all spent um, a lot of time, I mean, myself included, I guess I shouldn't uh, imply that everybody on the phone agrees with me, but, um, you know, in, in sort of uh, pushing back a little bit at uh, the, the fact that somebody else can tell us how to do what we know we need to do within, uh, both within the microcosm uh, of our actual physician-patient interaction and then sort of the bigger but still microcosm of the, of the practice. Um, and in the end, the answer we've just come up with over and over and over again is it takes a, a local community-based uh, sense of infrastructure, whether there's formal infrastructure there or not, uh, but, but a sense of who lives here, what do they need, and what's my role in that. Um, and if we could just make that simpler, um, certainly everybody has a role. Um, and uh, if, we, if we were intentional around designing our roles and, and measuring ourselves within the, the capability of filling the role that the population that we serve, and, and by extension, the population that lives here, however you define 
here. Um, and we could make this all a lot easier uh, as well as uh, you know deliver much higher quality as well as um, satisfy the, you know the actual needs of the place that we live and probably care about uh, so in the end this is really the main reason to participate in a in quality initiatives I think uh, a community-based quality initiative is because you know in the end who else would you like to have do that and I mean I think I think you know with Colorado my feeling is I'm not 100% clear what Baltimore or Washington DC really knows about the nuts and bolts and uh, of, of how things work the community attitudes the, the attitudes of practitioners at the general attitudes of, of people so um, in, in the end it all comes down to um, do you have a community that can um, uh, perceive the, the global system and help you define your role um, or don't you and if you don't what do you need to do to get there so um, I'm going to use, we all use uh, th these terms interchangeably uh, quite a bit, um, transitional care improvement and reducing readmissions. Um, and I just want to point out that they are not exactly the same thing, but that they have become very confused in our heads. And I also sort of use these terms interchangeably. Um, I'm working on improving transitional care and I'm working on reducing hospital readmissions. So clearly you can reduce, um, I mean, you can improve transitional care that first of all has nothing to do with hospital. Um, you can do a lot of improvements to the transitional care experience that may or may not have an immediate direct impact on hospital readmissions, but we tend to talk about them as if they were the same thing because it's just been so well documented in the literature that if you have poor transitional care, you're at much higher risk of um, having a lot of readmissions. And in the end, some of it comes down to measure specifications. So um, all of the evidence-based interventions that we say have evidence for improving transitional care have used as their measure of successful outcome 30-day, um, well, hospital readmissions within some time period. So they are not exactly the same thing. I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but in addition, you know, we are increasingly in um, an era where that, you know, there's an incredible focus on just cost control. Um, so with the focus on cost control driving so much of the healthcare reform um, discussion, uh, we really now almost always talk about reduced readmissions when what we really mean to say is improved transitional care. So I uh, just wanted to point that out that they are not exactly the same thing, but I'm going to talk about them as if they are. Um, so, so there's a lot of slides that you can see um, that show, I mean, there's just a lot of information about how we have this unsustainable um, cost growth uh, trajectory in medical spending, but, but this is sort of a different take on the usual way we look at um, cost of care in the U.S., and this uh, absolutely confirms what we have found in our work and part of the reason we have this community focus. And that is, if you look at the total of medical and non-medical health-related spending, um, the U.S. is not the most expensive country. Um, however, if you break that down into component parts, um, it's clear that we are underspending on um, social support services, the, the non-medical aspects of health, and that that has accompanied this enormous growth in our medical expenditures. So um, as you get to a more community-based focus, the um, availability of the non-medical health support network becomes absolutely critical. Um, in our work, we could not see what we do um, had we not uh, directly incorporated this concept into what we mean when we say get a community together and, and start to plan for who needs what and how we can deliver that um, the most um, effectively. Um, so uh, just, just as a sort of a polling question for me to understand um, my audience a little bit better, I'm just curious how familiar uh, folks on the phone are with the aging network. Now, I deal with Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries, so I'm very concerned about the aging network. Um, so I was just, um, you can select, oh, can they select more than one? Well, select the best one. Uh, we have an ADRC and I have their phone number memorized or I have referred at least one patient or family to our area agency on aging, or I know the aging network exists but have never directly um, interacted with it, and uh, for what's an ADRC? So should I go on while we're getting the answers to that? Oh, here we are. Okay, um, this was exactly our experience as of about two years ago when we entered this rapid learning curve about um, the presence of the aging network and, and what they can do 
uh, for folks with regards to improving transitional care. So um, I'm including comments later on in my slides, but um, I, I think this is a very common scenario. The, the medical services and non-medical services sectors have grown absolutely separately in the U.S. Um, they have separate funding streams, so medical services are paid through uh, CMS and these non-medical aging network services are paid through the Administration on Aging. Um, and I think there's been this perception that it would just all sort of work out. Um, but we have found tremendous benefits in terms of intentionally integrating medical practices with these um, non-medical, um, other government-funded um, support agencies. So um, our work is part of the uh, Partnership for Patients, so uh, CMS established the, their uh, main goals uh, at, under the their banner of the Partnership for Patients, and, the, and you know, the goal is better care and lower costs. So um, they uh, envision this as a public-private partnership, um, and over the course of three years, so uh, by 2013, they would like to see a 40% reduction in preventable hospital-acquired conditions and a 20% reduction in hospital readmission. So the QIO funding uh, that CMS has, has given us to work on this um, uh, area is a part of this partnership for patients. So I just wanted to, to briefly say where um, our journey started and is now because it's certainly a developmental work. We have a lot more work to do. Um, but, but we, in 2006, we got the uh, two um, tiny little pilot projects. And one was to promote, um, to see if we could uh, actually interact, um, I mean, we could implement Eric Coleman's um, care transitions intervention, which requires a transitions coach, which was then um, a completely unpayable service under the Medicare program. Uh, so we wanted to see if we could recruit providers and, um, who worked together, meaning served a lot of the same patients, and get them to um, process efficiency such that FTEs would actually be freed up to uh, make coaching an available service under current funding streams. Um, at the same time, we got a, a little project to see if we could intentionally recruit hospitals to target some element of non-beneficial utilization and, um, and see if they could intentionally reduce uh, non-beneficial services. So it was interesting, the value project was a four-state project and um, on the on the east and west coast, uh, the hospitals targeted, we didn't think it would turn out this way, but on the east and west coast, hospitals targeted use of ICU services at the end of life, and the states that were more in the middle of the country, and that included Colorado, um, targeted reducing readmissions through care transitions intervention. So, um, and it was hospitals that targeted um, reduced readmissions through improving transitional care services that made tremendous progress. So that turned into a 14 community pilot to intentionally recruit communities of providers that are or had interdependent practices um, to improve transitional care. And that pilot was successful. I'm going to show you our wimpy sort of interim results slides because um, this uh, work is pending publication, so I can't show you our actual results. But, but we were successful in producing a statistically significant reduction in that community-based um, hospital readmissions. So now we are now in what we call the 10th scope of work. And every QIO, there are 53 of us, is recruiting as many communities as they can who uh, will sign a charter to come together um, to create community uh, care patterns that reduce um, hospital readmissions for Medicare beneficiaries. So um, uh, this is just a, a brief overview of what we learned. I'd be happy to answer questions. It's, it's kind of hard to know where to start talking about this work. But, but the care transitions theme, the, the pilot that we just finished last August, um, went forward in 14 communities. And uh, CMS chose these communities for a variety of, uh, to, for a variety of situations uh, because what, what their main goal was was to learn um, from seeing uh, disparate types of communities uh, try to come together to reduce readmission rates so that we could see uh, essentially what, what the common features were and, and what the unique features were. So there's, there's the cornerstone of looking at geographic variation is to understand that uh, geographically speaking, I mean, in, in terms of culture and, and the way uh, services are delivered that you really don't know whether you compare one place to another uh, and you have to assume going into it you probably can't. Uh, so in the end, here's the most important thing that we learned. Um, we did, uh, we assessed readmissions through a variety of, of methods. We, you know, analyzed claims data uh, for our community population um, and we sort of looked at which providers were involved in the care patterns of people who had frequent readmissions. Um, we did medical records reviews of uh, uh, the, discharge medic the discharge medical record and then the readmission medical record. And across 14 communities, we had extremely consistent results. And so this is what we call our driver diagram. 
um, and this is just, there was so much agreement on these things that we pretty much feel like this uh, encompasses what we're dealing with. So, so at the patient provider interface, the reason people come back, the Medicare beneficiaries come back over and over again is um, no matter what else is going on and no matter how much teaching they have and, and you know, no matter what kind of, how high the quality of care is, when they get out of the hospital, they do not manage condition worsening. There's a large number of reasons why they just don't do that, but but they tend to just not manage condition worsening, and they're frightened, and they return to the um, hospital. Um, secondly, when you compare just the actual uh, medication regimens they were discharged on and the medication regimens they admit to taking when they come back, um, there's just frequently a gap there that, that people are not taking what you would consider to be ideal guideline-driven um, medication uh, regimens. Um, and then thirdly, uh, with regard to Medicare beneficiaries, over and over there is this choice to return to the emergency room. And um, that's, that's a, uh, an interesting phenomenon that we could be um, really addressing through different types of quality initiatives. But, but they do not call their home health provider. They don't call their primary care doc. They just choose to go back to an emergency room because that's what they know how to do. Um, so you have to ask why again. Well, why, if we know these are the problems and they're very consistent, why does this happen? And this is where we get to the system level drivers that most of our work has focused on. Um, so the first is um, that, that unlike any other industry, um, there has been really very little attention paid to developing a, a supply chain approach to longitudinal management of patients. So. You know, we have people within their walls doing you know, beautiful medication reconciliation. We have people mo uh, managing their processes within their practice environment. But this whole notion of sitting down with your partners um, pre and post, you know, wh wherever you handle them, um, where do they come from, where are you sending them to, and intentionally constructing, you know, a robust uh, workflow and process that can be measured and that people can be held accountable to, you know, we're just starting to do that now. Um, the second is this, this whole issue of reliable, um, absolutely reliable um, clinical information transfer. So I know that primary care docs are, are really the victims on this one, so I assume you're quite familiar with this problem. Um, and then the third thing is that we do not intentionally support people's ability to become effectively involved in their own care um, in your average acute care medical um, event. Uh, so if we have these three system level issues and we know them and they have been consistent and we didn't discover this, we've known this for a long time, um, why have we not solved this problem? I put a circle around the system level uh, drivers because there's actually a large number of uh, evidence-based interventions that address each one of these three um, uh, system level drivers and we know what they are and they've been published and they often have public domain free tools and resources. So why have we not solved that problem? And in 14 out of 14 communities, the answer we got is there's just no natural infrastructure for coming together with the intention of solving these problems. So um, here's the way I think of it. So when we talk about integrating care for populations and communities, um, so this is often used as a picture of dysfunction. And in some ways, it is a picture of dysfunction. But but really, this I think this displays all the elements that you need. So so you know you would you wouldn't want to develop the perfect scenario for how home health should interact with the physician office and how they should interact together with you know the potential um, return to the hospital. Um, you know, you would really want somebody who's an absolute expert in home health, ideally somebody who delivers home health services in people's homes, to be a part of that work. So you do actually need super specialists. You need somebody, you know, the person who knows absolutely the most about tails and ears and tusks, they have got to be a part of this work. Um, but you also need a way to, uh, some kind of a framework, even if that's just a standing meeting, or a meeting we're going to have three times over the next two months to iron out this um, information transfer process or some kind of specific uh, structure for people to work together. So the best example of this is some of the, the groundbreaking work that's going on with just hospitals working directly with nursing home facilities to absolutely standardize the information they send, the way they communicate that, the person who's in charge of that, you know, just, just some way to bridge across settings into a standard process. And then, of course, in the end, you need some way for the group of people who is trying to improve the care patterns received by this co-served population, you've got to have some way for that group to understand whether it's getting better or not. So you have to have this, this sort of collective impact infrastructure in which there is a backbone organization that can um, say, are things getting better around here or not? Um, so these are the three real components that, that we've tried to bring into our community-based projects. 
Um, so when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of building community infrastructure uh, in the last scope of work, uh, we used all four of these uh, types of methods. So there's a lot of situations in which uh, a hospital just wants to work with uh, one home health agency that, that they're either frustrated with, with just consistent problems or what's more often is we know we rely a lot on those guys and we would just love to sit down and make this just a formal push. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to make it easier on all of us. So that's the upper left-hand corner. Um, when it comes to community, um, in the lower uh, left-hand corner, a lot of the projects went forward first by organizing clusters around each hospital. So, you know, the hospital has two nursing homes they use a lot and two or three home health agencies that they use a lot. And so you can take what looks like a huge, messy problem and get it down to a finite number of providers that, that would benefit from coming to greater understanding of each other's processes sort of as a cluster. Um, and this was the most common approach we used in the care transition theme. Uh, but but the downside to this is you then have your smallest providers, and that often were primary care physicians, um, who really were participating in two or three clusters. So they were the least resourced um, components, and they, they, they really couldn't uh, participate fully because they would have been involved in a number of these hospital-based clusters. Um, so in the upper right-hand corner, this is now the, the, the in retrospect, this is, this is the method that I believe the most strongly in. So, there were a couple of communities in which hospitals wouldn't participate unless they knew their competitor hospitals were in. You know, like every hospital in this community is, has bought into this and has been signed the charter. And same with home health agencies and skilled nursing facilities. Um, we had difficulty reaching all the physicians. Um, so to my knowledge, nobody did this yet with physicians, but we would love to in this scope of work. Um, and that is, if you get home health as a, as a, a, a professional industry to come together and say, we as a group, um, hold, uh, we believe this is the best practice with regard to receiving transitions and with regard to sending somebody back to the hospital. We will hold ourselves accountable for transferring this type of information. Um, we will do this as a group of competitors um, so that the hospital could just respond to this constituency instead of having to develop customized products or this is how we refer to this home health agency versus that home health agency. Um, and this turned into a very powerful uh, way to move forward, is to say, you know, we as primary care base in this uh, community do exactly what we want. And we're going to uh, meet with the hospital, with the hospital, whatever we need to do to, uh, um, to get to where we understand a standard method for communicating, transferring a patient to home, which means by default the uh, primary care physician, and this is the way that, that we want to move forward. Then in the lower um, right-hand corner, there were a couple of communities that started right out with multi-stakeholder um, uh, committees, and that is in increasingly um, something that we believe is, is absolutely critical to sustain gain. So, um, all right, so about the aging network and ADRCs. So the, the, the wonderful thing that we discovered as we were looking at what people often need when they're discharged home is a lot of non-medical support, like transportation. They sometimes you know, need to have their medications delivered. Um, they need meal support. They can't get up their stairs, you know, whatever. Um, and the aging network funded through the Administration on Aging um, is, is funded directly to do this, to, to supply social and non-medical support needs to seniors. And senior by AOA is defined as 60 or older. Um, in their homes. So they are community-based. They often have county-type distributions. Um, and there's uh, one, in, at least one area agency on aging, usually multiple, in every state. So if you go to this um, website, their website, they have the elder care locator, um, you can find out where the area agency on aging in your um, community is, and it will have their phone number. Um, the AOA is increasingly um, funding uh, organizations to coalesce their services under a single phone number, uh, which is called an Adult Disability and Resource Center. Now, in some communities, um, this has been funded as a single phone number, 211, so just like 911. So you can tell patients, gosh, um, you know, your, your mom is going home and she has a number of needs. You can tell caregivers, just call 211. And see, you know, they, they will determine what your um, senior is eligible for, what services they are eligible for, and what they can deliver within the community. So AOA's goal is to ensure that there is an ADRC infrastructure in every state. Um, not every state has one yet, but that is uh, in process uh, within the next year, I think. And most states have one now. But the idea is there's no wrong door. There's a single phone number where you can just say, help. You know, my mom is 90. She's just returning home from the hospital. Or I have a patient who's being discharged from the hospital. Um, and, you know, we would like to keep her out of a nursing home, and, and I just want to know, you know, what's available in this area. Um, so, uh, 
The second most important thing we learned is that patient activation, and activation is defined as knowledge, skills, and confidence, is the most important driver uh, of readmission. So I put it in my driver's slide as one of three. Um, it, it's, it's the trump. Um, and so here's the situation you have, certainly with um, elderly folks. You really can't tell by talking to them um, who, who gets it and who doesn't. So, so what happens is the traditional method is for us to do a lot of education, we provide a lot of uh, materials and information, and then you ask somebody, you know, do you have any questions? Well, people um, people are sort of socialized to say, oh, no, thank you. Um, and for one thing, you know, they like you. They like their provider. Um, secondly, they're, um, they can see that you're working hard to make them understand. They tend to assume it's their fault for not understanding, and they're just, you know, it's human nature. You kind of feel like, oh, just let me get out of here and I'm sure I can figure this out. Um, so, so people who seem very confident in a, an average um, contact with a, a medical service provider, um, it, you, really, you really can't tell from that conversation. Um, so when it comes to patient activation, the most used and successful intervention uh, in the care transition team, oh, I always like to point out that the chronic care model, which I think we all view as sort of the, the ultimate roadmap to getting things better, um, it, it's right here in this lower part of the chronic care model um, that, that we, who are working hard to become this prepared and proactive practice team, are supposed to have productive interactions with our informed and activated patients. Um, and yet, it, it's just increasingly clear that if we don't become part of the activating structure, like that, that species is not just going to emerge without us um, intentionally developing methods of interacting with patients and families that intentionally activate them. Um, so the most used intervention was the care transitions intervention, and this is uh, Dr. Coleman's coaching intervention. And so um, I, I like to point out that, I know I don't have to tell this crowd this, but you know, primary care providers um, are in the situation constantly where they're it without being tagged. Um, you know, no matter how hard the hospitalist runs after the primary care doc, we know that in the best systems uh, that have been measured and published, um, make that direct contact uh, about 20% of the time. That's the best case scenario. Um, and I know we're all developing uh, better asynchronous communication methods. Um, but no matter, no, so the primary care doc is often is, and sometimes doesn't even know the patient's been in the hospital, much less discharged to their care. Um, but the person who's really it 24 hours a day and seven days a week often looks like this uh, woman on the right. Um, in fact, someone who looks like this may even be a caregiver for somebody else in her home who is less capable than she is. Um, and so the premise of patient activation is if you don't optimize her ability to self-manage, uh, not only have you created a bunch of additional extra work for yourself, you're probably not going to be successful. So no matter how much the person understands that they're supposed to take their medication twice a day, if they don't actually act on that twice a day, they are not getting their medication, even if that medication is in the home and they have perfect knowledge. Um, about what it is and what it does. So we, we really need to get more into understanding people's barriers to taking action and helping develop their confidence in um, managing their own care and to really make uh, really make progress. So the coaching intervention is quite effective. Uh, people who are coached um, have 50%, have a 50% reduction in um, readmissions, um, and this was uh, quite successfully used in a number of communities. Um, because the coaching intervention is a little more complicated, I, I like to make everybody very aware of the CMS discharge checklist. So um, a coach is, is a direct, um, they're not a patient advocate, but they, well, they're a coach, they become the patient's coach, but uh, that takes, you know, staff, a person, a training, that sort of thing. So so if you just don't know where to get started and you really want to get started with, with something for activation, um, CMS has now created and published it's on their website. You actually can sign up to get CMS to send these to you. Um, they have developed a patient and family discharge checklist. Uh, now, it's being most used with hospital discharge, but it was designed by um, an impressive team of um, experts, national experts, with a 14-question survey that patients, it, it asks patients and families, do you know this? And it was designed to be used in any care setting. So, so when you think about it, probably the best place to use this um, checklist is prior to hospitalization, if you know somebody's about to be hospitalized. And in your folks that have multiple chronic illnesses, um, you, you just you know they're at risk of hospitalization any time. And so, so this is a, a, a guideline that CMS owns. So you don't have to pretend like it doesn't. Have, well, the most practical aspect of this it has CMS's logo on it. So to use it in hospitals, we did not have to go through forms committees. Um, so you can say this is something that CMS would like for their insured to have, um, and uh, it's it's very informative for 
um, learning what people really do not have confidence around at the time they are changing the care setting. Um, so, um, so the first thing we learned was that uh, that, that um, uh, you have to create community infrastructure to improve. The second thing we learned is that patient activation really is the trump card. The third thing we learned was at least with regard to Medicare beneficiaries is that um, uh, understanding that much of Medicare care patterns have a last phase of life perspective. Um, it was also a very important concept and helped to drive improvement. So, so um, when you think about it, what we mean by chronic disease is, you know, chronic, incurable, um, and certainly the world mortality rate hasn't changed in quite some time, nor is it going to. So um, we've entered this, this, this political debate around death panels, which is an unfortunate distraction, but, but you know, really uh, most people and caregivers certainly understand that, that when you have patients that are 80 and have two or three chronic diseases, um, it is not a surprise that they are going to be living with that chronic disease and are likely to have elements of medical related issues with regard to those chronic diseases um, around the end of their life. Even if you can't determine a point in time in which they are entering end of life, it's really uh, appropriate to say with multiple chronic, you have multiple chronic diseases that are likely to be present um, at your death. And, and that can be uh, sort of the cornerstone for thinking about how, what kind of a service There's 1250 array. 1250 people have registered for a webinar. You see this one? Yeah, care coordination. <laughs> Somebody's not on mute. <laughs> you should see the next guy. The, 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 the <laughs> deaf, um, okay, you're not moderating this. No. But the guy from uh, Geisinger. Yep. Thomas Graf. Thomas Graf. Sorry about this. We're working on the issue of muting. Okay. All right. There you are. Please continue. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make folks aware of the Bridges Health Model. This was a paper, and I, uh, the URL or the, the uh, citation is below. Um, th this paper was published in 2007, and I think it's just a brilliant way to start thinking about population types and the resource arrays uh, that they might need. And so I'm going to focus on the end-of-life uh, care trajectories, uh, but I would encourage uh, folks, if you do primary care, you're involved in all uh, eight population segments as described in this paper, and um, it's been a useful way for me to frame my thinking around what sort of services do I need to know where they are in my community because I see these kind of patients. Um, so first is um, people who are approaching the end of life with a single progressive terminal disease, so mostly cancer. Um, so if you plot function of people, like using an Apache index or um, activities of daily living or whatever kind of functional assessment you want um, over time, uh, when you have single progressive disease, there is this really predictable and well understood uh, phase that we call dying. Um, when the person starts to, they do very, very well. They're almost at optimal function. And then they start to have problems. And they, they get worse and worse and worse until they die. And that, that phase of dying is actually pretty, um, has always been now as new treatments come out, you know, certainly it varies things. But, but it has always been a fairly predictable four to six months decline. Um, you know, with, with uh, people who uh, have end-stage cancer, they do very, very well. They start to decline, and they're, you know, gone within four to six months. So that is the origin of the hospice benefit. Um, and so for those folks, you can say, oh, yeah, this is a, an end-of-life phase, and, you know, you're appropriate for hospice. Um, but the, the issue is the hospice benefit was set up very much for this type of clinical pattern. Um, however, about a third of our folks in the U.S. die of, of what would be more appropriately called uh, multiple organ system failure. So this uh, type of patient often is told that they have heart failure, and they often do have heart failure, but, you know, they also have COPD and diabetes and osteoporosis, and, you know, um, I'm sure you, uh, the primary care physicians are quite familiar with this, with this patient type. So they have a completely different experience of care. Um, in that what happens to them is they get a cold, they, you know, decompensate, they get put in the hospital because they're wheezing or they're short of breath or they're, you know, they have the dwindle, um, we buff them back up, they get almost back to normal, um, go on for a while, you know, get the next event, another cold, um, and they, they go through this pattern over and over again. Uh, well, when you look at, when you plot function over time towards death, um, this was based on um, data from the support trial, the average time from recognition that, oh my gosh, I think 
this is it, they're dying. So this, this phase of recognizing dying to death on average is about 14 hours. So this is not the kind of situation in which what we think of as the hospice benefits was well designed. Um, and in fact, this is uh, the work of Joanne Lynn, and uh, she told me that her epiphany came when uh, she was a hospice care provider for a long time, um, that uh, when she had been taking care of a very frail woman who had exactly this, this care pattern and had really end-stage heart failure, and when she died, and, and um, Dr. Lynn called the family, and the family said, oh, had I known she was dying, I would have come. And, and this is where it occurred to her that, you know, we, uh, based on a lot of the early work, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, we, we, we recognize dying when it is an active phase, so there's this thing called dying. But for folks who have multiple chronic organ failure, um, this is really their life. As you look back, you can see, you know, five years ago, we probably could have predicted this kind of pattern. And, you know, maybe that's where we need to be starting to think about talking to people about their expectations around hospitalization and their, you know, overall care planning. Um, so this is this is the population that uh, leads to very frequent hospitalization. So that's why I'm particularly interested in how people are thinking about managing uh, multiple chronic organ failure in um, elderly populations. Um, and then the third way that people die in this country, and this is becoming an increasing proportion of our population as we, you know, get better treatments for the other two, um, and that is just this long, uh, dwindling uh, frailty and dementia type trajectory. Um, there are some situations in which uh, frailty and dementia leads to repeated hospitalizations. Um, we seem to be making progress in that with uh, increased recognition of, um, of you know, avoiding um, over-proceduralizing um, treatments for uh, folks who have advanced in dementia. So um, I am very curious to know um, from a primary care physician perspective um, whether or not what you believe would be feasible in terms of using the Bridges to Health uh, framework to, to take a look at your patient population as potentially a place to start in thinking about you know, population management. So, so um, uh, I have done this and have appropriate care plans in place for most according to these, this way of thinking. Um, I haven't done this uh, but could easily do so or I haven't done this and it sounds really hard to apply to my population, or um, I don't treat elderly patients. So um, for those of you who are uh, pediatricians, <laughs> there are some pediatric trajectories, but I didn't go over them. Okay, so yeah, for, so for those of you who um, try this, I would love to know how it turns out. Um, I know in Colorado I've spoken to a number of primary care physicians and presented this model to them, and they, and they feel that they probably could think about doing this, just taking a look at their population, uh, their elderly population, and saying, oh yeah, no, no, this is clearly a multiple chronic organ failure type. Uh, person, and I think this person is probably more along the dementia frailty um, guideline. So if anybody who does this, I would love to know um, how it turns out, how it, whether it seems palatable to you, whether it was a useful exercise, um, or whether uh, you really felt that it didn't help. So anyway, I, I, my contact information is somewhere in this slide deck, so I would love to know. Um, all right, so um, moving on. Um, so the fourth key thing that we learned is this uh, notion that you can directly reach out to your community and it will surprise you uh, what your community will do for you. So when we talked a lot about community action and that sort of thing, what we finally did, um, this was in uh, our project in Denver, we finally just had a community meeting where we had hospitals and physicians present what they were doing to try to ensure um, reduced reliance on unwanted hospitalization. And so many people came forward saying, I just want to help, that we were able to form um, four, well, five action teams who volunteered their time, met once a month for something like 15 months, and actually produced products that were useful um, to reducing readmission. So this is just a picture of the Northwest Denver Personal Health Record. Um, they developed this record through this committee. They um, assessed money from each other, <laughs> largely. These, a lot of these were the social services network uh, folks and uh, printed them up and uh, are distributing them through grocery stores and pharmacies and of course the hospitals um, are giving these to patients at the time of hospital discharge. Um, I don't have follow-up date on this unfortunately at the time, so I can't say. 
All right, the fifth thing is this proportion readmissions measure um, is kind of a problem. I would encourage everybody to look at population-based readmission measures. Um, so when we went into the project looking at the typical measure, which is number of readmissions divided by number of hospital discharges, uh, so that proportionate relationship, what happened is right out of the box, that proportionate relationship went up for most communities. At the same time, absolute number of readmissions was going down. And that is because work to reduce readmissions also reduces admissions, which is your denominator. So it depends on which one goes down faster, what your proportionate rate is. So um, we made a move to just uh, to go to simple population counts, which is a much better way for us to track our progress. Um, so that was number of readmissions divided by um, number of people in the community, basically. Um, so we, we track number of readmissions per thousand fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries. Um, in our community. So um, using that measure, this is our uh, interim results. We reduced uh, both admissions and readmissions by about um, uh, almost 6%. Um, the background trend was more like 3%, and this is a statistically significant result. So, so we very much believe in the community approach. Um, all right, so in, in general, the, the communities that were successful in the care transition theme um, used coaching. Uh, they really focused on strategic partnerships with non-medical support services. Um, you have to work across settings. People can't solve this problem within their own walls. Um, and always, there was at least one visionary, passionate, very strong leader um, in the community. And certainly, physicians are ideally suited to be visionary leaders that people will follow. It didn't have to be a physician, but in communities in which a physician got all on fire was going to solve this problem, um, they made tremendous gain. Um, there's a number of evidence-based models out there, and um, I would encourage everyone to look at evidence-based models. The reality is uh, they all needed to be tailored to um, actual community situations, such as we already have funding to do X, Y, or Z model. Um, so if you uh, go forward within a community framework in a population context, um, you can tailor the interventions effectively um, to be sure that you're getting the most um, efficient community-based improvement um, initiative uh, that, that you can. So I just wanted to talk briefly, and I think I'm almost out of time, about, so starting in August, so the care transition theme, which I just showed the results from, ended in August, and we are now disseminating this through the entire national QIO program, um, and it is called the Integrating Care for Populations and Communities AIM. So there's 53 states and territories that have a QIO. Um, uh, in the QIO program, we've um, recruited uh, more than 200 communities. I think we're up to about 260. Um, and the aim is to improve the quality of care uh, with for transitional care and to reduce 30-day hospital readmissions. Now, the QIO is just there to help convene and provide technical assistance um, and is part of our contract to integrate efforts with other local initiatives, um, such as medical home initiatives. Um, so the type of technical assistance that QIOs can uh, give is um, help forming community coalitions. So we have people develop and sign a charter to be sort of accountable to participate um, to each other. Um, we um, can help with a strategic plan, so it seems like everybody's funded to do sort of something, um, and just having kind of a global idea of how it all might come together on behalf of the population is quite useful. And uh, one of the most useful things we can do is use Medicare claims data to create a social network map um, of the uh, relationships among community providers. Um, so this is fee-for-service Medicare data only, so it's not the entire community, but, but often fee-for-service Medicare is a pretty good place to start when you start to talk about the population that receives a lot of services from a lot of different providers. Um, so in addition to uh, helping communities form, you know, coalitions, um, we uh, can help folks do root cause analysis. So um, we're, uh, CMS very much likes to see uh, data-driven improvement efforts. So root cause analysis um, we do by, by certainly analyzing Medicare claims data. Um, we can um, assist with uh, providers mapping their processes that touch each other. Um, certainly the notion of actually reviewing medical records and summarizing what you find, why are people going back to the hospital is very powerful. Um, and then, you know, interviewing patients, there's really no substitute for <laughs> interviewing patients about why they think they went back to the hospital. Um, certainly we have hospitalists doing this in a number of communities, um, but, but primary care physicians are probably a better place to do that. Um, you know, in retrospect, um, why do you think that, that you went back to the hospital? So it's very important, you know, that this happened in the patient's own words, I think, so that we're not putting sort of our judgment value on why we think they went back to the hospital. So, um, the third element of technical assistance is just intervention selection and implementation. There's a lot of information out there about these evidence-based models. Um, we published sort of a table of evidence-based models in 2000 and 
10, I think, in the Remington report. This is not peer reviewed. This is based on our um, uh, contract, what, what, what CMS accepted as evidence. We turned the table that was in our proposal um, into this um, article. So if you really have no idea what's out there, you can start with that. It's a little outdated. Um, there, there are better, um, probably more updated um, uh, resources like this at um, NTOC, the National Transitions of Care Coalition, and um, certainly some other places. Um, the two most interventions were the care transitions intervention and the transitional care nursing model. The nursing model is an actual medical care model, unlike coaching. Coaching is a, um, a self-efficacy uh, capacity uh, development model so that individual patients develop capacity to self-manage. Um, we uh, also can uh, supply technical assistance um, um, uh, for helping finalize applications to um, the Community-Based Care Transitions Program, which is a, a pilot project that CMS um, is paying for successful transitional care uh, models that incorporate the services of folks otherwise not payable under uh, Medicare rules uh, of engagement. So uh, Transitions Coaches is uh, one of the key uh, components that they can pay for um, under this program. Um, so this is the URL. Um, it's on the demonstration uh, page website at CMS. Um, and then the last thing is we can um, use Medicare claims data now to share with communities. So communities that have signed a coalition charter um, to go forward to reduce community-based readmission rates, um, we can um, now uh, give data feedback. So the one um, measure that we are producing for every single zip code in the U.S. is number of rehospitalizations. Um, per thousand and number of hospitalizations per thousand. So these aren't hospital days, this is occurrence of a hospitalization or a rehospitalization assigned to a geographically defined population. So I'm going to show you our maps here in a second. We've, we've done um, the entire country. Um, no doubt people are more interested in you know, their zip codes, which is appropriate. Um, QIO recruited communities, this is a little bit old, um, but these are places where QIOs are um, actively working with communities that have signed coalition charters. Um, and if you overlay that with um, the number of communities that have been awarded, oh, this is also old now, there's about 32 um, awardees under the Community-Based Care Transitions Program. Um, so uh, there's an updated uh, map on our website. Um, and here's our um, map of readmission incidents. So readmissions per thousand. Um, as you can see, it's, it's uh, no big surprise, I think, where the utilization of, of services appears to be higher. Um, I would say my perspective on readmissions at this point is uh, I believe in a lot of ways your presence readmission rate reflects community capacity. And community capacity reflects the ability to leverage each other's activities. Um, I think in most communities in the U.S., I would, I would describe them as resource rich. Um, the, the issues really have to do with um, well, no infrastructure for intentional collective action, um, I think, and um, that, that's really the message that we are trying to um, promote and to um, produce uh, sort of practical strategies uh, for moving forward on this. Um, this is, uh, that, that last was just a picture of our website, so I put the URL on the title of my slides, but there's a huge amount of resources and tools here. Um, and then um, if I had to summarize what I think a primary care physician could do, uh, within the framework that we're trying to do, which is community collective action. Um, certainly participating in a community coalition, you know, primary care physicians have, have a lot of sway in these coalitions, and they should. People would like to build these care patterns around primary care. Um, if, if you have no idea uh, uh, what's going on in your community, you could call your QIO. Um, if you just Google your state and QIO, it will take you typically to their webpage, and there will be a project manager uh, that you can call. Um, I think the formation of a physician receivers work group, we've just seen that work so many times. So when I was talking about coalition building and I said these lateral coalitions where all the home health agencies get together, all the skilled nursing center, uh, uh, facilities get together, certainly all the primary care physicians getting together and saying this is exactly what we want um, at the time of the hospital discharge and this is what we agree to send you when we are sending someone to the hospital is a very powerful way to proceed. Um, certainly uh, those uh, receivers work groups, primary care receiver work groups go a lot better if a primary care physician <laughs> volunteers to lead and direct that discussion. Um, certainly those of you who uh, care to try uh, applying the Bridges to Health model, I would, I would love to know how that uh, works for you. And then um, anytime you can contribute data to population-based efforts to some uh, measure of how things go around here 
um, I would encourage you to consider consider doing that. I think the most powerful improvement is collective improvement, and it really takes collective data. Uh, so uh, we're not going to show this now, but I would encourage everyone to take a look at this um, this YouTube video. This is a, a, a really very insightful three-minute video on how to drive a movement. And we're starting to think about um, healthcare reform as, a, as really a social movement. Um, so this is a, a very um, well-expressed message that um, it's often not the leader that has the most impact, it's the first follower. So, uh, so the message of this is don't be afraid to, if you see something really great going on, to join that movement and, and figure out how you can contribute to a groundswell of, um, of regional improvement. So thank you. That's, that's, uh, I'm going to conclude my comments here. Hi. Tom Graff, so I guess that puts me in a bit of a, a challenging position since I am the first follower after that uh, great presentation. Hopefully we will, uh, we will have the ability to create some movement here. Um, enough of my picture, or first of all, the Geisinger uh, uh, view. It, it is kind of nice to work in a place where you get that sort of panorama uh, all the time. I actually practiced in Southwest Georgia for a while where it was completely flat, which is a little disconcerting after a while. Um, you know, the, the um, problem in this country, as highlighted a bit earlier, is that we really have an issue of cost and quality. And as you can see, you know, the United States not only spends more, at least on the medical side, per capita, but we're really in a, in a sort of a, a league of our own. We're so far out at, that, it's, that there's no one else really even in the race. Uh, and, you know, in the 90s, the perspective on that was that, you know, we could either have high cost or, excuse me, we'd either have low cost or high quality, and we really had to choose. And then we went through this period where there was, you know, a questionable at best relationship between um, cost and quality. But, you know, I think there's emerging data now uh, that shows that, in fact, there is a linear relationship between cost and quality, but is, in fact, uh, you know, opposite of what you might at first think, that high quality, in fact, leads to lower cost. And if you think about redesigning care uh, by eliminating the either the 30 or 40 percent of care that uh, adds no value or in fact harms people, or more importantly really pushing more care at folks so that more expensive longer term downstream costs can be avoided, things like reducing readmissions, things like uh, you know reducing uh, infections in uh, surgical patients or uh, you know the fact that most chronic disease hospitalizations are really, in many ways, failures of the outpatient management plan. As you get ahead on those pieces, you can really create um, a lot of downstream value. And that's really been our postulate, that you can drive quality to lower cost. And not always. There are plenty of things that you can do that will improve quality that won't lower cost, but there are lots of things that you can. If you lead with those, you can sort of pull the rest. And uh, to me, this was sort of fascinating um, data out a few years ago. In response to that question, we really decided that we needed to involve uh, sort of every aspect of the healthcare team, from the patient to the electronic health record as an active member of the team. We'll talk a little bit about how we did that, uh, including um, obviously the the, uh, the payers, the health plans in that, because they had a very uh, different and unique skill set in view and a different and unique way to um, to connect with patients. So guys, you're going to have an, obviously a large opportunity in that we have both a uh, physician a medical group, about 1,000 docs, a 300,000 member health plan, and a, and a uh, series of hospitals. So we have the ability to partner in some ways that it's at least easier and faster than, than most. But we recognize that the health plan brought this population analysis approach um, that was lacking. And, and, you know, to me, it's an issue of thinking through that, you know, everything in medicine can at some high level be predicted. Uh, and then driving that down to an, an area that you can make an operational impact on, uh, let's say an office level. And so, you know, the obvious example of that that, that in retrospect is, is ridiculously simple, but is not something that we think about. Um, we do have to go to um, we do have to go to the um, practice level to really make those changes. So, if you think about admissions, right? We know on average how many patients get admitted from each office each week. And, uh, you know, the way medicine works, there's about a four-day hospital stay, and then almost all, if not all of those patients, come back out, and they're going to need follow-up appointments. Well, 
let's just plan for those follow-up appointments in the schedule rather than trying to wedge these sick, complicated, uh, you know, patients that had some interventions, a lot of things changed in the hospitals, in at lunchtime or wedging them in at the end of the day. If you start to plan for these, you can actually make folks' lives better. And the health plan brought that perspective and that ability to do it. We also obviously have um, total cost data, which is something, and utilization data, which are things that we've not had um, to complete the picture. Uh, you know, on the other hand, the, the only folks that can really deliver the care are the physicians, the clinical enterprise part. The ability to look at patient level outcomes is, uh, you know, another critically important piece. And then redesigning that care delivery is something that can pretty much only be done on the on the preventer side, uh, provider side. Uh, we deployed our, mo our, our pilots in 2006. Uh, two of these sites were Geisinger owned sites. One was a non Geisinger owned site, so a private practice that contracted with our health plan. Uh, they didn't actually even have an electronic health record at the time, they, they do now. And we rolled out about a dozen sites a year, um, starting about six months after the pilots were completed, such that we now have about 350,000 patients that we're caring for in this model with um, total quality data on all, all of those patients and cost and utilization data on about 80,000 patients, 50,000 through our Medicare Advantage plan, another 30,000 through CMS and the physician group practice demonstration. Um, it's currently about 20% of this uh, is done in non-geysinger practices and we've actually now started to spread the model into other states with, with groups that have uh, you know no real connection to it. So two docs, a nurse, a paper and pencil can really get this done. And what it's about is moving from that um, you know patient alone trying to navigate the healthcare system to um, the, the medical team, which includes physicians and nurses and front desk staff and everybody that they interact with, working together to manage through um, this confusing system and owning them. Uh, the chief medical officer of our health plan actually described it as you know, sort of like your children, right? You think you know where they are all the time. Uh, no matter where they are, whether they're in the hospital or the nursing home or the doctor's office or the pharmacy, you're going to try and help them. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're financially responsible. And uh, with my daughter headed off to college this fall, I think I'll have a new appreciation for financial responsibility with uh, lack of control. So um, if we move, move ahead, our Proven Health Navigator, our primary care uh, advanced medical home model, has five um, core components. The first is this physician-directed, team-delivered care. Uh, that's optimized around chronic disease management, that enhances uh, prevention and wellness, and really drives for improved patient and family engagement. We'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. We also have what we call integrated population management. That's taking those health plan skills and deploying them into the primary care office. You know, while care coordination itself is very important, uh, that's only one aspect, one element of this much more uh, complete primary care redesign that includes a strategy to define the clinical population, parse it into clinically meaningful different segments, figure out what each of those segments needs, and push that, that support um, at them so that you have patients that are as well as they can be, patients that have chronic disease so it's as stable as it can be, trying to prevent next year's patients that need this high level um, uh, you know, patient coordination and, and support. Um, just managing the sickest of the sick is probably uh, sort of yesterday's strategy, if that makes sense. No matter how good a job you do in managing those patients through the primary care office, you're going to need to interact with the rest of the healthcare system, whether it's hospitals or nursing homes, home health agencies, obviously specialty offices, and building a high quality support network is critically important. Uh, every program has to have its quality components. Ours is quality gated across um, comprehensive preventive and chronic disease uh, metrics. We include patient experience in that for obvious reasons. Uh, and then the last piece is really redesigning the healthcare uh, payment model, which includes um, maintaining fee for service revenue for the, as the base. We, we maintained our quality programs. We were not trying to play a shell game with the doctors around figuring out what they um, what they were, you know, where they were going to get paid or how they're going to pay, but we added a quality gated shared savings model, not unlike the, the, um, you know, transitions demonstration that we're in with CMS now or the um, Pioneer ACO or the Medicare Shared Savings Program. They're all sort of working across this 
uh, total cost of care management. So primary care redesign has, you know, these basic elements, engaging the family, um, physician-directed team-delivered care, this concept of everybody on the team having a role and working at the, the top of their license in a self-directed manner is uh, very important. And then finally, um, you know, leveraging the electronic health record as a integral part of the team was, was critical for us in creating this, but only as a second step. Um, HRs or electronics in general are great accelerators, but you have to have the right people process in place first so that you can make it go fast and get benefit. If you've got a, if you've got a very bad process in place, making it can go fast just produces a lot of garbage, not something that we want to have. Um, so, sorry about that. So as we set about to redesign primary care, we really did it in a, um, in a fundamentally, I'm trying to go back one, sorry, fundamentally different concept where we would have um, this, the idea of eliminating, first of all, and I've eliminated it from the slide, any steps that don't add value. Automating what can be done. Computers are very good at doing the exact same thing over and over again turn those parts over to the computer, right? Physicians need to concentrate on what I call physician work, which is complex medical decision making and um, patient relationships. Everything else should be done for and around them. And so delegating to folks working at the top of their license, scheduling of appropriate follow-ups and, 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 and uh, immunizations is a clerical task. Let the, let, let the clerical staff manage that. Process measures, getting lab testing completed, giving the immunizations, performing diabetic foot exams, those kinds of process things, uh, we turn over to the nurses. And we set it up in a way that the nurses are um, created for, uh, created to, to be able to succeed. You know, the problem with physicians is it doesn't matter how poor we are at doing something, if we're going to allow someone else to do it on our patients, they have to do it not better than we do it. They have to do it 100% of the time. They have to get it right 100% of the time. It's not reasonable. It's not rational. But it is the way we're trained and socialized. Uh, and, and so creating a system that allows folks to uh, achieve that is very important. So when we say turned over diabetic foot exams to our nurses, we didn't just say, oh, all the nurses are going to do diabetic foot exams. Good luck. No, we created a system that allowed us to, um, you know, we trained the nurses on how to do diabetic foot exams. We gave them all monofilaments. We created a documentation tool in the electronic health record so they could appropriately document according to CMS guidelines every time. Uh, we created an alert in the electronic health record that told the nurses or reminded the nurses which patients needed to have their diabetic foot exam done. And then they had to prove confidence. We watched them do a diabetic foot exam. And so when we created that system and turned it over to the nurses to do it, the nurses got it right not 27% of the time, which is how often our physicians got it right, or at least documented it right 27% of the time. They got it right 100% of the time. And those kinds of um, improvements are, are the heart of what we do. We try to find ways to reliably deliver better care. Now, the next piece is you have to incorporate these new changes into the standard workflow. If you don't, it's you know, always subject to that uh, innovation degradation kind of thing where it goes away. And so incorporating these processes into the normal workflow the flow using, again, these operational informatics, the electronic health record redesign, to support that, making it as easy as possible for folks to get the right answer. And then the last piece of it, as we all know, patients who are more engaged in their care um, do much better on a long-term basis, finding ways to engage them with patient-specific report cards, allowing them access to the portal. Those kinds of things are critical for our success. Um, this is an example of the, of the screenshot that we use to, for the patients. These are alerts that we use in the health record that allow us to um, remind patients, right, computers doing the same thing over and over again, reminding the doctors around complex medical decision making. This is not a real patient. If it would, there'd be, there'd be actual values there. So the physicians would get the alert that says, you know, patient's hemoglobin A1C was 7.4 a week ago Tuesday. What are you going to do? We don't tell people how to practice medicine, but we do prompt them to make active medical decisions. The pneumovax and flu alerts, the number two and three there, those would be directed only to the nurse, all right, saying, look, this patient needs their shot. If we can give a flu shot in a grocery store, we ought to be able to give a flu shot in the doctor's office with a standing order. Um, same thing, collecting a urine, um, a nursing function. And when we turn that over to the nurses, actually, 
they um, improve the, the performance on it. They, they close the gap from the, the actual performance to 100%. Um, they close it by half within four months. So very impressive movement when you turn process measures over to nurses. This is the um, results of our comprehensive diabetes bundle. Uh, you can see the individual scores are you know, reasonably good, but the percentage of patients that were getting every single element of care, relatively low to start with, 2.4%. Uh, we had a 500% improvement as we deployed that across the service line. You can see that occurred mostly in the process measures first, the intermediate outcome measures, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, blood sugar control, you know, trailing somewhat, but um, very important. Each person on the team, this doesn't have all nine me measures, they don't fit on the slide well, but each person on the team has pieces that they're responsible for. The physicians are primarily responsible for those intermediate control measures as well as the smoking piece. Uh, nurses responsible for the process measures, the scheduling pieces uh, go to the schedulers. Going through this a little bit fast in the interest of time, so I apologize. The result of that, this is actually important, um, was that in less than three years, we were able to show with an intention to treat analysis that patients that were assigned to a site that had a system of care for every 151 patients that were assigned to that site, treated, if you will, uh, you know, more or less, we'll have to see. Uh, for every 101, 151 patients, we prevented one case of retinopathy. For every 82 patients, we prevented one heart attack. For every 178 patients, um, one stroke. So very quick, you know, less than three years, very significant um, impact. Um, moving along, the um, preventive care bundle, prevention is a, is a non, you know, complex medical decision-making task and a non, uh, you know, really uh, person task in many ways. Uh, assuming the patient agrees, all we have to do is, um, is get these things scheduled for the most part. So we turn that over to the electronics. Uh, we send a letter to the patient on the month of their birth that says, happy birthday, this is Geisinger, we care about your health. These are all the things that you're due for. Uh, we'll be contacting you to uh, arrange those. And uh, then we point the auto dialer at them. If they, when they pick up the phone or if they call us, we connect them immediately to a live agent who knows who they are, why we call them, what they need to have done, sequences it appropriately so it culminates in a physician visit. Very nice, very simple, very organized. You come in. These are all the results of your screening tests because they're all pushed at me on a single summary screen. This is the one that's abnormal. This is what we're going to do about it. Um, and, you know, results in statistically effective um, improvement in, in their HEDIS control measures, which is, um, to me, you know, sort of the, the interim step, if you will, in terms of uh, improvement. So uh, this is your, your chance to really talk about things. How uh, effective is your current methodology for driving the cultural change necessary for physician-directed team-delivered care? To me, that is the hardest part. I sort of call myself the, the culture czar. I used to call myself the culture Nazi. That has some negative connotations. Didn't like that. Thought I'd go a little further east to, to the czar thing that seems to be sort of popular in, in uh, Russia right now. So do you feel that you have been, a, been very effective at creating cultural change, effective, ineffective, or the very ineffective sort of level? The um, you know, culture change is one of the hardest to drive and probably the um, most challenging to, uh, to sustain. But really, beyond any of the other things that, um, uh, that we do is probably the hardest. So let's see how we did on the results. There we go. So yeah, the bell-shaped curve uh, seems to work. Although, folks, probably more effective than, than a lot of places, and I think that, you know, fits with the audience when we think about um, this particular group of, uh, of people being involved with PCPCC for uh, some time. Hopefully, we've started to move that, uh, that along. All right. So, um, you know, this concept of stratifying the population and pushing pieces at them is important. There are other things that we do in the health promotion or disease management stage to keep well people well and, and you know, moderately well people moderately well. But as you can see, there's a significant group of patients that need this high-level case management, which includes care coordination, includes uh, what I call emerging exacerbation management. So following the patients close enough so when their heart failure starts to get out of control, they are immediately supported 
as opposed to waiting until they're 20 pounds overweight and now the only option is the hospital because they're hypoxic. Uh, managing a generic utilization in an era of cost is important. You know, clearly with the donut hole, we don't need patients running out of money in November. Uh, clearly that leads to readmissions. Um, and we've seen that sort of happen. We do, um, we do uh, risk adjustment or predictive modeling to know who's likely to be into trouble. But the challenge is we take what the computer generates and then we add into that the clinical piece. So we review these lists with the physician um, so that they can add their knowledge of the patient and, and know that, yeah, sure, some people that look to be low risk that really probably are very high risk and people that you know, apparently are high risk because they had some significant intervention last year that are doing well and are likely to have very little trouble. We, um, we create this uh, embedded case manager position uh, that uh, staffs our office, they manage 150 patients or so. Uh, they form a very tight relationship. They call those patients once a day, once a week, once a month, whatever it takes to support that person through their, their disease. But they, they do care coordination, but they really focus on the driving disease. So the person may have six or eight comorbidities, but their COPD or their heart failure or their renal disease, whatever it is, whatever that one that seems to create the most uh, trouble is what they really focus on and, and drive it from a medical perspective. Form that sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship with the patient and tightly connect to um, the physicians to make it happen. They do it in the physician office, which makes a big difference. What do they do? They do a lot of tactical things. They contact each patient, you know, post-discharge within 24, usually occasionally it goes as long as 48 hours. They do med reconciliation. They make sure that the transition plan is in place. They make sure the patient knows what to do uh, if they run into trouble, which, you know, as we talked about earlier, hopefully is not go to the emergency room. Uh, and then they make sure that we see the, um, see the patient in the office within uh, three to five days to really drive that um, readmission reduction down. We have proactive plans. We know if patients with heart failure are going to get into trouble, let's just plan for it and uh, know what to do. So often patients can can activate their COPD rescue kits or their diuretic titration protocols from home. Because uh, you know what, if it's 8 o'clock at night in central Pennsylvania, uh, there's probably not a pharmacy open. So if they don't have the medicine at home, you're not going to be able to do anything. The only option is going to the nurse, uh, going to the emergency room rather. You know, connecting with the rest of the medical neighborhood, critically important. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, to redesign this is, you know, partnering closely with home health agencies, knowing who and what is going to be able to support patients at home. So, you know, if it's Friday afternoon, can they get a nurse out there to do a straight cath on a paraplegic patient so that we can head off a urinary tract infection? Those kinds of things are, are important, and choosing your partners well is, uh, you know, one way to make this happen, working closely with them to make sure that they understand the performance metrics. Uh, the other thing is redesigning the care in the nursing home. Readmission rate from nursing home is something like 33% within 30 days, even the patients that quote unquote live in the nursing home spend two to four uh, stays in the acute hospital uh, each year. Uh, and it's not surprising, right? The patient who was so sick that they were being seen by, you know, three medical teams in the hospital every day and then go to the nursing home and they might be seen once every 30 days, not terribly surprising. So we changed that. We put advanced practitioners into the nursing home as their day job and they do all the things that we talked about on the primary care side as far as managing emerging exacerbations and, and transitions of care um, closely. And the results were, you know, pretty significant. If you look at sort of the first one, which is your prototypical 34%, we're able to reduce that um, by, you know, almost half. Uh, in nursing home B, which is a very high-performing nursing home, had a very engaged physician medical director. She spent about 30% of her time, time on site by supplementing her presence with the, the advanced practitioner and really training the staff and jumping on these things, we're able to get a further 20% reduction. So, uh, you know, sort of works at your average, your bad performers, but also your high performers. How fast do you see impact? Readmission reduction, you can see within three months, you can sort of read through the rest of the list, um, but it can happen very quickly. So what do patients think about this, right? Well, we asked them, we were a little afraid because you never know, patients react to the new norm pretty quickly. But after six months after a site went live with our full model, we ask them, is the quality different and better? Because obviously it could be different and worse. Different and better than in the past. And, you know, three quarters of them said, said yes, that they were very interested, uh, felt that the um, quality did improve. On the physician side, uh, you know, same kind of question. 
is this is this new model better? Does it allow you to provide more comprehensive care? And again, we were happy to see that you know 86% of physicians agreed or strongly agreed with um, with the uh, improvements that we're seeing. Would they recommend it to others? Again, over over 90% um, would uh, would recommend the model to others. As the um, diabolical medical director, I tried to figure out who said no and uh, and why. And you know, really, it comes down to if the team delivered care model is not for you, then um, you know you wouldn't recommend it to your to your uh, peers. And that made a lot of sense. The next several slides go through our quality and, and outcomes. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly, just to, in the interest of time. Uh, quality improvement across the board, so our comprehensive bundle or our specific control. You can see each you know year phase, each phase year over year, the improvement was um, pretty substantial, at, somewhat regardless of where the baseline was. You can see in our phase four sites here, for instance, in in coronary disease, they were very high to to begin with, uh, but they were able to increase it. You know, maybe in phase three, those folks weren't performing as well, but large improvements over the few years of the of the um, experiment. This is a slide that shows our Medicare aged acute admissions, so hospital admissions. It's a little bit confusing. The, the brown bar is the is the comparison group, the, the book of business, not in uh, Proven Health Navigator. Uh, the black dot there shows the average of all the blue bars at the start. So just give you an idea, we we were a little better than average to begin with. But the three pilot sites, 2007 through um, 2010, uh, you know, a significant improvement. Uh, the sites that were added in 2008, uh, you know, big improvement. And then we sort of held it despite, um, you know, adding all in. So not just our top performers and our best in class people, but uh, you know, those that are a little, little harder to get along. So a, a, you know, definite systemic improvement, if you will, across the board in admissions. Same thing for readmissions. Um, ER is a little bit different story. Basically, what ER showed is that it, we held the ER utilization flat while the wild state increased. So, uh, you know, to us, that's about a 25% improvement in, in ER rates. Um, important. Same kind of um, experience in commercial. In fact, is much more dramatic impact on the ER side. Uh, a little bit less on the on the hospitalization side, but the numbers are so small that it's hard to to make too much out of that. Uh, whoops, almost skipped it. So the second polling question for you, do you have the ability to measure all four areas of the triple aim? And then I always call it the triple aim plus, which is patient experience, quality, and cost, but also professional experience. If we uh, make these changes, but they're all sort of at the expense of the medical professionals, the doctors and nurses that have to deliver care, we're really not going to um, have a sustainable model. So let's see how we did. How many folks are measuring what? And there we are. So, so almost a quarter of the sites are measuring all four areas: cost, quality, and professional and patient experience. That's tremendous. Uh, and a, a small group that are you know struggling. I mean, data is a really hard thing to get, and cost data, in particular, um, is a challenge. As we you know, seen even CMS trying to support groups uh, like the PCPCC have had trouble with that. All right, let's finish up so we can get to questions. So you know, here's sort of the whoops, the punchline: a seven and a half percent reduced uh, attributable trend uh, sustained. And actually, this was published in the um, American Journal of Managed Care, March edition. Uh, what it showed is a nice dose response curve. So uh, years one and two, it's about a four percent impact. Years three and four, it's about a seven percent impact, seven and a half percent. Years uh, beyond uh, four, so five and six, we saw up to a ten percent decrease in attributable spend. Uh, Pretty impressive. Obviously, if we could all do that, that would be um, helpful. You know, the challenge is it's it's uh, difficult. It takes time. It needs to be physician-led. You need to have an empowered team, um, and, and they need to be actively engaged. The transitions of care, so in and out of the hospital, in and out of the emergency room, in and out of the nursing home, those are um, huge opportunities since they're all, uh, you know, a chance for quality and safety degradation. Um, you know, in our model. 
one of the critical elements is having a case manager embedded in the primary care site. They need to be part of the primary care team, not remote, not um, uh, in the only, you know only focused on taking care of those patients. But they need to have that um, mindset that that's a little different, um, that's really population focused rather than individual patient focused. And then finally, you know, if you're only concentrating on the sickest of the sick patients, uh, you're neglecting those that are going to become next year's sickest of the sick and losing a big part of that um, opportunity. And so redesigning the care for every patient in the practice, whether they're, uh, you know, 20 and healthy or 70 and, and subjected to a large number of chronic diseases. Um, so with that, I uh, will open it up for questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graff. Um, it's a really excellent presentation and appreciate you all taking the time to do this. And so we want to um, move into the question period and I've got quite a few lined up already. Thanks to everybody um, in the uh, question box. So if you have a question, you can feel free to enter it there. I'm not sure I'll get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, so I'm going to go back to a question um, for Dr. Brock. Um, and the question is, uh, why would a, why or how would a private practice expend resources, financial and sweat equity on a program like this? How, can it pay for itself in the office-based physician practice you know, that has a large inpatient service uh, um, or not? And what would you recommend for a, for a uh, small physician practice in this area? So um, the community-based care transitions program um, is to uh, pay for transitional care services through what's called a community-based organization. So um, the app, you can apply to primary care practices are eligible to be community-based organizations. They're, they're really the one exception to the otherwise rule that this is intended to pay folks who do not otherwise bill Medicare. Um, but um, I would encourage you to go to the demonstration uh, website page and look at the solicitation and see if you think that you could qualify by for, uh, forming formal partnerships uh, with hospitals. Um, in, the, in the end, um, uh, I think the primary benefit to primary care practices is in the gained efficiency from having um, an understanding of your role in the network of services in your community. and, and not reproducing a lot of activity on both sides of, uh, of a care transition. So um, I, I realize that's not as satisfying as um, an opportunity for huge upfront funding, <laughs> uh, but certainly the CCTP is something you should look at. The CCTP is intended to be a lower risk way to enter into accountable care arrangements. Thank you. Uh, and a related question that came in for Dr. Graff is, um, so regarding integrating non-medical and psychosocial needs, how does your PCMH model address those aspects of a patient's care in the primary care setting? And if it does not, how do you think social work services can best approach PCMH practices to integrate into the care team? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. We have a, we're primarily focused on the medical need. Now, obviously, you cannot divorce yourself from that, and patients with chronic disease have a, a disproportionately high rate of, um, of, of uh, behavioral needs. And so, you know, what we've done is really, because the nurses that are working in the offices are also members of the community, they are typically able to access the community resources um, that are available to support patients locally, and that's the, the primary mode. Obviously, we've um, actually just started doing depression screening on uh, any chronic disease patient at, at, at all of our sites in a, in a regimented fashion. And so, I, you know, I think what we're going to do is generate a large number of uh, untapped need and connecting those people with the, the resources as well as enhancing the ability of the primary care physicians to address some of those basic needs. Um, is an important piece. Uh, the challenge is obviously for us finding resources across a, a uh, you know, 43 county area in uh, rural Pennsylvania where the support is often uh, spotty. I think we're going to look to technology and uh, sort of telepsychiatry and telebehavioral health as a as a way to bridge that. So you know, a lot of times it's it's telling folks that you have the resources that are available. Uh, to support it, the ability to connect those into the um, medical home, just like we connect with other elements beyond the office, uh, you know, is something that, that we're good at and I think most, um, most medical homes are, are equipped to do. 
Great, thank you. A uh, question that came in for both of you, and uh, this may well be our last question because we're already towards the end of our time. I'll try to fit in one more beyond this if we can. And that is, appreciating that IPAs are generally more loosely integrated than medical groups, how do you see hospitals coordinating care with IPAs, especially around communicating to physicians and patient activation in the absence of a jointed EHR network? Um, so we actually have a little experience with this. We're working on deploying our model with uh, the Taconic IPA in New York, and, and you know, depending on what the infrastructure of the IPA itself is, that often can be the coordinating function, and that's what um, that's what they're doing up there and doing a very nice uh, job of it. The other the other way that you know, straightforward are the regional health information networks or or um, you know, other uh, provide uh, providers of electronics that will support that connectivity beyond the four walls. But, you know, having said that, a number of our sites, because we work with 14 different community hospitals that are not guising our own, but we do inpatient work at, uh, you know, faxes can work just fine, paper systems, being able to uh, remote into their electronic systems. I know one of our sites, the first thing that our, our staff does each morning is go into their um, hospital census and look for patients of ours that were admitted overnight. So basic procedures, you need to get the information, but there's a lot of times just basic blocking and tackling things that'll get it done. Yeah, so I, I think IPAs uh, form the perfect vehicle for um, organizing physicians as an industry for um, framing their um, expectations, their definition of transitional care quality, um, and, and really leading the efforts driving the mission and vision to standardize transitional care. Um, so to me, that's the most practical uh, use of IPAs. And in Colorado, that's, that's, we have a number of strong IPAs that have really been leaders in saying, this is how we want it to happen around here. Um, and, and this is the, the part we are willing to um, lead or direct or uh, be the sort of de facto experts uh, for, for this work. Great. Thanks so much to both of you. We are at time, and so I want to be respectful of that. Um, we do have other questions in the queue, and we'll try to get those to the presenters so perhaps they can answer them um, following the presentation. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone today for attending today's presentation, and Dr. Brock and Dr. Graff for their time today. Um, the webcast is now ended. Thank you again for joining, and have a great day.